Okay, good evening everybody um, and welcome to the RAS uh, AIAA Joint Mary Jackson named lecture. Um, I am Pete Round, I am the president of the Royal Aeronautical Society and uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar this evening. A couple of housekeeping announcements for you. The first is that microphones and cameras will remain off for the duration of the lecture. Um, and if you would like to join in Q&A, and I hope you really do hope you, you do, uh, please use the Q&A box, which I think you'll find at the top of the screen. Um, and then what we'll do, uh, ask a question whenever you like, we'll uh, collect these, uh, do a little bit of collation and make sure that uh, uh, plenty of questions are asked at the end of the lecture. Uh, for your information, the event's being recorded and will be available to watch later on our YouTube channel. So if for any reason you can't stay for all of it, you can pick at the end and obviously we'll be advertising it to those who can't be here. So a little bit about the Mary Jackson lecture. So the Mary Jackson name lecture is given in honour of Mary Jackson, who uh, was with us from 1921 to 2005. And she, in 1958, became the first black female aerospace engineer at the UK National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA to most of us. This lecture is jointly sponsored by the Society's Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee and by the Diversity and Inclusion Working, Committee, Working Group of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, AIAA. And I'm very pleased to welcome all of the AIAA uh, membership to our, uh, to our lecture. So we've got a, a esteemed speaker, speaker tonight, Dr. Jason Marathon Arden, who is a member of the Royal Aeronautical Society with 20 years in aerospace. Um, he started his career as a bioinstrumentation engineer at the European Space Agency, ESA, and then he left space and became an internationally experienced venture building capital raiser. He came back to Europe and space as a business broker in ADESA, specialising in access to finance, particularly working in partnerships with venture capital. He's a startup mentor, company board member and investor. He's also a member of the Society's Specialist Space, sorry, Space Specialist Group. Currently, he's UK Managing Director for HE Space Operations, where he's developing its UK business focused on providing manpower to the space sector. Um, and we're really looking forward to what he's got to say. So, Jason, I shall pass across to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for doing this for us. Great. Thank you very much, Peter, for um, for that very kind introduction. And uh, really, you know, what I wanted to do here really is talk about uh, breaking uh, the rules of uh, of the space sector, and this really is the essence of, uh, in my opinion, diversity. And really, you know, the first caveat for uh, for this presentation is really this: it, when I talk about space, uh, breaking the uh, the space rules, uh, it's a non-exhaustive or uh, um, in terms of list of what I think uh, the rules have been broken over the last fifty uh, stroke sixty years of the space sector. And really, what I'll do here is is really um, uh, make the presentation. Uh, flow uh, in terms of the path of of of, of Mary Jackson, as well. So uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, the society, in particular uh, Nick and uh, Kayla, and also thank you to uh, AIAA, um, in particular Claudine as well, who's join us, who joins us from uh, from California as well. So thank you very much for allowing me to be um, uh, to give this uh, to give this presentation. Okay, let's uh, move to the next slide, please. OK, so Peter mentioned it already in uh, in his introduction, uh, Mary Jackson, apologies for the uh, uh, for the uh, for the text here, the color of the text. Um, but really, you know, what I wanted to do here is really point out the uh, the, the major achievements. Uh, 1958 to 1985, her NASA career, uh, as uh, as you all know, and as Peter um, mentioned in the introduction. But really, you've got the uh, the the post achievements uh, in terms of uh, what happened relatively recently from 2019, in terms of the Congressional Medal, and also the fact that uh, there are there is a building in the U.S. Uh, named after um, uh, after Mary Jackson, and uh, really, what I'd like to do there is really, you know, and this is really, uh, if you think she had uh, an amazing career, and uh, really, what I'm going to try and do here is really break the presentation to essentially two parts of uh, uh, of her career. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. A uh, little bit about me uh, in terms of uh, where I'm going uh, with uh, with this. Oh, excellent. Okay. 
and uh, really the, the president. And so really my background here is uh, 20 years in space. Uh, like Mary Jackson, uh, I had uh, essentially two breaks in my career. Uh, the first one really was in the technical side of, uh, of the space business, in particular engineering and human space flights. And you see a picture in the back here of a Soyuz uh, landing. And I was lucky enough uh, in my early 20s to be part of uh, the Soyuz return crew for one of the uh, ESA missions. And uh, relatively recently, um, I rejoined uh, ESA as uh, uh, as Peter said, uh, in the field of commercialization. And really, you know, for me, what the two two main things that drive me in the space business is really uh, the technology, but also uh, the money and the human beings as well behind that. OK, so enough about me. This is really about uh, breaking the rules. OK, so let's move to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. So when we talk about uh, certainly when I start thinking about breaking the rules, the first thing that I was thinking about is, well, actually, you know what? There's an awful lot of stuff has happened in the uh, in the space sector. And really, you know, when we talk about space, we talk about technology. But when we talk about technology, is technology did technology break the rules? Yes, of course. But underpinning that uh, that rule breaking in terms of uh, the technology development of space, you have uh, motivations, actors, contents and also roles that underpin how a technology is being uh, being driven and really what I, where I wanted to go here is really just to give you a very brief overview of um, of these types of factors and where the and, and where the technology is uh, is certainly being uh, uh, diversified in the context of uh, of space and for a bit of fun here you uh, what I've what I've uh, put up here is a picture of Mary Jackson in the wind tunnel but also her uh, one of her publications as well. OK, let's move to the to the next slide, please. OK, so when we talk about. Motivations. And rule breaking, you some sometimes some people, some camps will say, well, actually, you know what? The space sector is a bit of a wild west. Um, there is some, uh, you know, with this recent, let's say, with the new space economy and the new space sector, there's been a bit of, uh, let's say, unregulated uh, activity. And then if you look at the old space guys, they will say, well, actually, what underpins this is, uh, is regulation. And when I look at those two things, you know, the motivation for certainly the diversification or certainly breaking this, the space sector rules has always been a narrative. And the narrative really is in terms of the decision making to identify in terms, in this case, socially acceptable space activities. And the definition of socially acceptable really is what, is what has changed, in my personal opinion, um, over the last uh, 50 years of the of the space sector, which has really led to the um, the breaking of the rules. But really, you know, you should. Well, well, one thing that should always be in the back of the mind are uh, international space law, right? OK, it is. Is it a Wild West? Yes, to a certain extent. But really what's needed now is that, you know, is really um, the reflection back on on regulation, in particular um, outer space treaty, and also long term sustainability of outer space activities, the LTS guidelines, which has come in because a degree of run regulation has led to, let's say, a big diversification in terms of space technologies. But now as these uh, space technologies uh, mature, we are starting to see issues cropping up and and we and really we do need regulation now and there are certainly parties outside uh, of um, of the presentation here that is driving that regulation and driving let's say that um, uh, that under that 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 um, foundation that is required to keep the uh, the space sector moving okay i don't want to dwell too much on this but let's uh, move to the next slide please okay so the headlines, the headline grabbers that have been breaking the rules are things such as the space sector economy is going to increase by 1.1 trillion or more by 2040. Well, actually, this this um, th th this headline here is, I would say, at least five years old. Is it still applicable? Yes, it is. Uh, in fact, it's just been updated and it's still in the in the trillions. And we see here that really who, what is what has uh, broken the rule here? Well, actually, it's been the uh, allocation or let's say the the, the movement of uh, private capital or private venture capital money uh, into the market. You see here there are three uh, headline grabbers, Virgin, Blue Origin and SpaceX. OK, you know, Virgin at the moment is if you look at its current share price, it's uh, and it, it, it's not doing particularly well. But the point is that uh, these three incumbents entered the market 
and really broke the rules, right? They realized that actually we didn't need to wait for an agency. We didn't need to wait for uh, uh, for for um, uh, for other people's agendas. They really wanted to push ahead and uh, and forge the um, uh, uh, forge the new space market. There are other incumbents here like Spire Global that have done the same, certainly in terms of uh, uh, CubeSats and uh, access to uh, uh, generation of uh, proprietary data. But really, you know, these are the three that grab the um, uh, that grab the the headlines. However, and I'll put the however later on in the presentation. OK, let's move to the next slide. Because of these guys uh, grabbing the uh, the headlines, you see here that really uh, grabbing the headlines and, and you've got the one trillion market. What you see here is the private capital uh, activity into the space market has really changed and broken the rules in terms of the types of businesses that are out there, uh, how they're growing and how they are able to grow. And I get and, and I and because of that, you see that the types of uh, investor backed businesses is quite diverse. You have the venture ca venture capital backed businesses, you have the seed businesses and also businesses that have been acquired or actually, you know what, they don't really need uh, venture capital um, financing, but they need something else. And what's breaking and, and the reason why I have this pie chart here is because it's showing you basically what's what's breaking the rules here is there are lots of different types of money, lots of different types of investors. And I get asked a lot, OK, what are the investors looking at in terms of the space sector? And when you think about investors, one thing that's worth noting is that investors are not just a generic uh, uh, breed or one particular flavor. There are lots of different types. So you have seed, angel, uh, the, uh, growth investors, which are just series A, B, C, D, whatever, C, and, then, uh, and then series uh, series F, G, H, these are, let's say, the publicly floated type uh, uh, investors. And you see that um, the deal sizes get bigger. You see here in terms of the space sector that there's a lot of movement that's uh, happened since 2019. And uh, there's, OK, although this is a 2021 slide, if you look at a 2022, you'll see that uh, the average deal sizes are even bigger as well. And there's lots of activity. And the interesting thing also in terms of being the game changer is because um, space is now considered as a viable financial or investment um, um, activity or sector or target that's that's brought in um, that's brought in uh, financial mechanisms to actually fuel the uh, the market and create a, a new new type or new generation of uh, of businesses there's a term here called SPAC, and uh, you know some people would say there's been a lot of SPAC hysteria. SPACs are really bad for the uh, for the space sector. They're they're collapsing, and that will actually implode the, um, the 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 business. But really, I put SPACs down here as game changers because essentially, the financial markets looked at the space sector, are looking at the space sector, and they are applying um, uh, they're applying financial mechanisms to allow uh, space business to grow. And for those that don't know what a SPAC is, a SPAC by definition is a company that doesn't have uh, any operations and it's formed for the sole purpose of acquiring another business. And really the reason why it does that is that it's an, another mechanism to gain, to uh, to generate significantly large um, amounts of money uh, to, uh, to fund a, um, um, uh, to fund the company to actually make it happen. Because as we know, uh, space companies, uh, certainly upstream space companies, by definition, are very capital uh, uh, in intensive. And really, what's what's changing the game here is that you know space is a uh, is a viable investment target. Let's move on, please, because I'm conscious of the time. So because of that, um, because space is a uh, is is an investment target. You know, if you were looking at space twenty, let's say twenty years ago, so and you ask somebody, okay, what does the space sector look like? You would actually see a bubble diagram like the one on the left, right? Lots of different sectors, lots of different subsectors, lots of different types and places where you can go. And frankly, quite a, um, a confusing uh, landscape for let's say the non-space professional or the non-space, uh, let's say educated to actually try and understand. Because of all these mechanisms, because of all these different types of investors, because space is a as an investment target, you see here that what's changed now uh, has been that uh, moving from, let's say, um, the, the bubble diagram to very clearly defined segmentation 
in the space sector as far as investment activity is concerned. And because of this uh, very clear segmentation, there has been very clear growth in each one of these sectors, right? So, for example, we launch takes it has a lot of headlines, but you know what's make, but what's uh, what else is, is is interesting? You've got the application side of things. Uh, you've got the uh, in orbit uh, servicing, manufacturing, uh, the the uh, global navigation and uh, and critical infrastructure, and recently, you know, you've got uh, the um, uh, a lot of investment has got dedicated investment has gone into space junk and detection. So what we're seeing here now in terms of uh, and what we're seeing here in terms of breaking the rules is really diversification and very clear diversification of um, of the space sector in terms of technology but also in terms of let's say the, the emergence of commoditization uh, within uh, different uh, technology fields within the space sector and so that's really you know the culture of the space sector has really changed a lot in terms of uh, um, in, in terms of technology driven um, driving uh, driving okay let's move to the next slide please OK, so when we talk about the um, the segmentation and really the, the 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 culture, what we see here is. What we see here is a, is a move is a paradigm shift from old space to new space. And when we talk about new space, really what's broken the rules here is really going to be the access to to orbit and which has been easier and and uh, getting cheaper and what we and what we mean here is that when you start looking at back actually what's being at, being generated in orbit you've got the data you've got applications you've got the whole digitalization of the uh, space value chain from ground uh, infrastructure all the way to uh, compute to uh, to, uh, to systems compute and really what's created there is really that huge diversification in, in technology in terms of who's what who is building what and what actually is being built and really what's driven what's driven all of that is the investment but ultimately it's the um it's the fact that it's easier to get into orbit now it's easier to generate data it's easier to get that data down and it's easier also to use that data in some commercial way as well. OK, let's move. Let's let's move to the next slide and start looking at some uh, some examples. So when we start looking at uh, the examples of, let's say, diversification, that's breaking the rules, I, kept, I was thinking, well, actually, what's the best way of uh, of 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 exploring that? And I thought, well, actually, why don't we just take a, uh, a relatively grotesque sum of money? Let's call it 100 million euros or dollars or whatever it is, depending on the exchange rate. And let's try and figure out, OK, well, what could we get with that money? Uh, uh, over the last, let's say, 40, 50 years of uh, of space. Well, traditionally for 100 million dollars uh, or 100 million euros, what did we get? Well, we got a satellite that looked like um, uh, the one uh, in the uh, in the white box. Essentially, very large structure, very capable, lots of uh, heavy engineering. Uh, and really that it basically designed for a particular uh, purpose and that was really it right you know a huge life a, quite a quite a long uh, lifetime and quite a large uh, commercial activity associated with its uh, operational lifetime as well but fast forward well actually rather than getting 100 million for one single thing you can get for 100 billion dollars we can start building or euros we can start building constellations constellations of thousands and thousands of uh, of, of satellites uh, producing uh, constellation capabilities that uh, we can only dream of but really underpinning that is really data 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 right you know generation of lots and lots of data to bring down to for, for applications and what i mean by data i mean uh, gps signals uh, earth observation data and even the telecommunications piece as well right and for a hundred million dollars well actually we don't we, we can also build spacecraft that actually don't need to be in geostationary orbit uh, we can actually build things such as a haps and uh, we can start building different types of uh, satellites so let's say or pseudo satellite platforms that's uh, which is uh, and you see an example of a of a hap structure which looks like an elongated uh, balloon and really for 100 million dollars what you're seeing here now is that or euros you're seeing a massive diversification in the types of spacecraft that you can build next slide please so 
with that diversification, you then start seeing, well, actually, you know what? It's a lot easier now in terms of accessing space, and it's a lot easier in terms of generating data. And now what we've seen is a huge commoditization in terms of the types of uh, satellite platforms that are available. And you see here, in my opinion, at this moment, there are, there are three uh, essentially uh, commoditized uh, platforms. You have CubeSats, uh, which are good for Earth observation uh, traditionally. Uh, then you move into, let's say, slightly more uh, capable um, uh, spacecraft in terms of small sats, such as OneWeb and Starlink, and then you move to even higher capability uh, satellites, such as uh, the geostationary orbits, which are essentially the traditional 100 million euro uh, domain systems. But interestingly, what's happening now is that the CubeSat, so if you go back to CubeSats, and if I relabel this uh, slide, well, actually, I can say, well, what's breaking the rules here now is really the technology that's going into CubeSats. And they are really, you know, um, although they're not as small as this, they're around 30 new, usually in size. Uh, when they get to that size, that means they're now competing in terms of SATCOM applications as well. And, you know, an example of that is just have a look at uh, the European Space Agency's their own fleet of uh, CubeSats, and they are being developed from anything from Earth observation to interplanetary sciences to all sorts of things. So really CubeSats, you can say here now, are really breaking the rules in terms of uh, the diversification of satellite technology. Can we go to the next slide, please? So let's take a, let's take it one step further. OK, slightly bigger. What's uh, what 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 what's uh, breaking the rules here? Really, these are microgravity platforms. We don't need to wait now for uh, space agencies to um, to create space stations. And 2025, 2026, probably 2027 will probably be seen as the year of uh, of the space station. And what you see here are examples of let's say the uh, the best in class leaders. You've got Axiom. Uh, platform uh, to the left and to the right, you have the Blue Origin Orbital Reef uh, platform, which essentially will go online online uh, around uh, those time frames. And if you look on the on the on the right hand side, you'll see a, a small little square or a rectangle um, underneath the uh, orbital reef. And you see here what's breaking the rules here now also is uh, the Genesis uh, single person spacecraft, which is now hang on. We now, rather than talking about orbital space planes, we now have new concepts in terms of uh, EVA uh, technologies. And while all of that is being built and developed, what's changing the rules? Well, actually, uh, uh, if you look at the blue, if you look at the white square to the left, uh, you have uh, an example of a microgravity platform, which is called Ice Cubes. And really, you know, that again, what's breaking the rules here is access to microgravity platforms for experimentation. Uh, and also for uh, for sciences. Let's move on, please. OK, so this is the however bit. So I've spoken a lot about uh, private capital, the, the players and things like that. But really, I like to bring it back uh, full circle to really the biggest rule breaker. And in my opinion, the biggest rule, rule breaker has been and continues to be the um, uh, public money, the, the agencies, the space agencies. And really, what what has underpinned the uh, the access uh, to the space sector in terms of commercialization and anchor contracts for Blue Origin and SpaceX and 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 all of those guys really is public money. Have a look, go back in history, and we see that you know there was initial seed seed activity of seven point two billion, which really uh, has been investment since two thousand. And you look here in terms of uh, in terms of uh, agencies and what they're trying to do. And you've got another headline here of uh, incumbents like the European Space Agency actually teaming up with uh, uh, with with, uh, with private capital as well. Let's go to the next slide, please. So if we look at the history, so let's say the last 19 years of uh, of, of what type of money uh, has gone actually gone into the space sector, you see here that in 2000 there was a lot of uh, private uh, private money. That was going into the uh, in, 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 into the in, sorry public money uh, going into the space sector, but really what's happening here is that continually it's been it's been um, been growing and it, it, it continues to be a, uh, a successful uh, part of the uh, space financing mix. Okay, so let's uh, move. Let's take a slightly different track here. So let's uh, let's move to the next slide, please. And let's concentrate on the uh, the final part of where I see the rules being broken. And what we see here is, you know, if you look at Mary Jackson's career, it wasn't just technology. 
but it was also helping and hiring the next generation. And really, this is very close. This is very uh, close to uh, to my heart in terms of uh, how do we um, uh, move the sector forward. And in particular, I've been paying a lot of attention to really what is the future of the space professional and really how is it going to evolve? How does it need to evolve? And let's move to the next slide, please. And when we start talking about the evolution of uh, the space professional, in particular, what roles will they play? And what we're seeing already is that there's a lot of diversification in types in, in terms of uh, in terms of the space professional. The space professional uh, doesn't need to be technical. It doesn't necessarily need to be an aerospace engineer. Um, and uh, for example, you've got legal contracts, procurement, those types of guys, as well as aerospace, uh, as well as aerospace engineering. But the other sectors are other technical sectors uh, are, let's say, crowding into the space sector to make it move and uh, evolve in such a way that you're able to create these technologies uh, that I uh, that I mentioned, these groundbreaking technologies or rule breaking technologies that I mentioned previously. For example, Industry 4.0, you know, these type, you know, uh, machine learning, data, uh, data science, um, cloud infrastructure, cloud compute. You know, this is a, these are skills that are required to uh, to move the uh, to move the sector forward. Next slide, please. So when we look at the um, at the types of um, uh, of, of 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 jobs and also in, in terms of uh, how uh, what the space professional is likely to do moving forward, we see here that the agencies uh, are certainly uh, changing the, uh, the the narratives in terms of where the sector is going. And also this narrative is really important in terms of uh, drawing a diverse pool of uh, candidates and professionals into the space sector. For example, if we look at the UKSA, they talk about attracting investment, uh, delivery, the delivery of capability, but importantly, it's building an ecosystem. And what does that actually mean? Well, when you build an ecosystem, you need lots of different actors, lots of different types of space professionals. And so, the space professional has to change and will change. When you look at um, the uh, uh, the European Space Agency's agenda, you see here you've got narratives such as space for uh, for green future. You've got a, a response to crisis and also the protection of uh, of assets. And these are themes that uh, resonate uh, well with people outside of the space sector uh, that they want to come into the space sector and they really want to use their skill sets to actually drive the uh, the sector technologically commercially uh policy um forward as well and when you look on across the pond in terms of the usa we see here that they actually have very similar narratives as well in terms of where the space sector is going in terms of addressing climate crisis promoting rules and norms, which is quite similar to rapid and quick response to crisis. But interestingly, what, they, what what's put what, what's been identified here is building a STEM workforce. OK, I'm going to be a little bit controversial here in terms of the STEM workforce. That's great in terms of, let's say, um, 10 or the next 10, 20 years or next generation. But what about now? Let's move to the next slide, please. So when we're talking about, uh, um, you know, in terms of uh, the skill sets or what the space professional is likely to, to be in terms of the now, what I like to do is look back at the space, at the financials and say, OK, well, what are we good at and what we're not good at? Well, what we are really good at in terms of the new space sector is building early stage businesses. OK, there's a lot of support out there, lots of information, lots of budding entrepreneurs. And what we're really good at in is the also the 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 growth activity in terms of the yellow box, the series E, F, G, H is right. So you could say these are the um, the publicly listed businesses or the or the businesses that have been around for a long, long time, uh, such as the primes or the tier ones. And, you know, traditionally, if you did an aerospace engineering degree, you went into those types of businesses. But then you've got the businesses that are in the uh, in the in the red box. And those are the ones in between, the ones that are struggling to grow or trying to grow to get and eventually become a prime or a tier one. And this is really where the diversification of skills is really, really needed. This is where the space professional is really, really changing. 
what is a space professional? Is a space professional somebody that has an aerospace engineering degree or somebody that doesn't have an aerospace engineering degree, but is actually uh, working in the space sector? And I would say, yes, it's somebody working in the space sector. So the next question is going to be, well, OK, well, how do we equip these guys that are girls that are working outside of the space that that are outside of the space sector and want to come in and want to actually be part of the space sector, creating, developing the diverse range of technologies that I mentioned in part one. And and my friends at uh, the Space Skills Alliance, they've been looking at this and what we see here is um, they have suggested some improvements in, in particular, uh, developing co uh, competency frameworks, uh, developing best practices for recruitment, which we've been looking at as well. Uh, also opportunities for young people, but this is where uh, but in well, 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 for me, it's all about skills provision and it's skills provision, not at STEM, but certainly at people that have got two, three years worth of, of experience and are using and, and would like to bring in or port in their technical capability, whether it's engineering or math, math, mathematics or law or, or business development into the sector. And really, this is where I see the, uh, the uh, if, if we can skill up these guys in some particular way in terms of uh, making it easier for uh, for mid career trainers and also to to uh, for the training to be more responsive, this is where I see the um, the big change in, uh, in in skills and training and the future of the space professional is going to happen because we need people from all sorts of backgrounds. Next slide, please. So. I've, I, so in terms of the future of space professional, I've mentioned the diverse, diver, diversification in terms of uh, the different types of roles. I put in brackets the hybrid working. Well, moving forward, you know, the jury is still out. You know, will everybody need to go back to work um, uh, five days a week? I don't know. You know, it's 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 not I, you know, the, the, the the demand or let's say the expectation of the space professional is going to change, certainly in terms of the expectation of hybrid working. Definitely, uh, we're going to be cross-disciplinary, and that really is drawing in the skills from the four point industry 4.0 sector, such as machine learning, cloud compute, et cetera, et cetera. And with that, we need to have the uh, a redefinition, in my opinion, of, of soft skills. And in this case, certification. If you look at other sectors, in particular IT sector, uh, take inspiration from uh, certificates such as AWS uh, certifications, the space, the space professional to enter the space sector easily may not necessarily need to go and do a master's degree. There will be some sort of soft certifications for um, uh, for these guys to actually transition uh, into the space sector and actually be employable. And then, uh, interestingly, I think what we're seeing here, certainly uh, on um, it, certainly in, in in the US, is company noise, company uh, um, company. Um, uh, reputation. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, Facebook, they've had difficulties in terms of uh, their, their recruitment piece. And what you're seeing here is actually the, the, the space professional is going to be a lot more choosy purely because there's a lot more um, there are a lot more types of, uh, of companies to work for in terms of who they want to work for and the types of things that they want to do as well. And so, and so, you, so this is these are really the, uh, the, the I would say the the five drivers of what's going to shape the, uh, the the space professional, and certainly be um, uh, when we have when we have this conversation or this presentation, let's say in uh, five, six, or even two years from now, you'll see that um, you know the space professional is going to change, and and these and and these five things will be breaking the rules in terms of uh, in, in terms of that. Okay, so. Let's move to the next slide, please. Where so um, what I'm going to do here is really I'm just gonna, I've spoken a lot. I've mentioned a lot of things. I've uh, gone through lots and lots of different types of, uh, of of rule breakings. And really, you know, I'd like to end the presentation here with this slide, and in particular this picture in the back, which is really quite a nice one because really it's showing that uh, a, a commercial company, in particular Axiom, has been developing spacesuits, and in particular spacesuits around. Uh, around uh, EVAs, and you saw yesterday there was uh, the headlines in terms of the reveal of the Artemis III uh, lunar spacesuits as well. So nice example of uh, how rules can be broken, uh, and uh, really we don't need to wait for uh, for agencies in terms of uh, those types of opportunities. So thank you very much, and uh, I hand over 
uh, to uh, to Richard Inter for uh, for the Q and A. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you very much indeed for for that uh, talk. As I said, we've got about. 15, 20 minutes maybe for, for Q&A. If you want to ask a question, uh, please uh, enter it into the, the Q&A box that hopefully you'll find at the top of the Teams bar and we will we will try and get through them. Um, Jason, the first question then is about, you've talked a little bit about uh, commoditization of space. And I suppose I was just interested in how you think that will drive technology or will conversely companies seek to you know focus on how to get costs down and it's about it's about being the cheapest not necessarily the most innovative so how do you how do you see that developing okay so in terms of the evolution of the let's say the space sector i think the narrative has changed now right so i tell everybody new space is uh, essentially teenage space or you could say uh, something else space and really you know the driver there was faster better cheaper and really the cheaper was the access to orbit what you're seeing now is that the drive, because we have that commoditization, because there is that expectation that, um, uh, let's certainly in terms of data and access to data and platforms is, is there, we need to move to a, not, there needs to be an evolution of business models. And the evolution of business models and the evolution of the, of the companies that are, let's say, implementing these business models means that actually the race to the bottom is not, is, is, is not there. What they need now is a, is a, is a, is is a, a mature, or much more mature offering in terms of uh, the technical provision, whether it's a data, whether it's data platform or something else. You know, garage. Uh, let's say gar uh, companies that came out from garages. You know, in terms of the Silicon Valley, um, let's say um, uh, Rainbow Story was great, but really that's not really where the sector is going now. So what you will see here, the drive now will be for um, uh, for greater technological capability and also costs uh, associated with that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in terms of the, you know, you've talked a little bit about, you know, the startups, more people maybe being in the sector. How do you, you know, historically, if you wanted to be in space, you had to be in the US or Japan or Europe. Um, how do you see um, opportunities for you know wider global involvement latin america whatever that might be and do, do you think more organizations being involved yeah i think if you look at uh, the um have a look if you look at the creation of national space agencies you know you'll see that uh, you know there are huge there, there are so many there's quite an explosion of uh, of, of space agencies now coming online right and they have very then they have very uh, different sizes if you look at uh, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere southern hemisphere obviously we've got the the there's the african space agency um then you look on southeast asia you've got activity going on in uh, in, in singapore malaysia uh, indonesia if you look at the australia if you look at the apac region you've got uh, the australian space agency and what they're trying to do there so where there are space agencies, there is a need. And also you've also in parallel, you've also got the uh, um, the different types of uh, space companies as well. You know, I mentioned uh, Singapore again. Singapore traditionally wasn't seen as a manufacturing uh, country, but now there are um, uh, satellite manufacturers in, in, in Singapore. So, you know, so you don't need to cross the pond either going that way or crossing the water going that way to uh, to be in the space sector. OK, thank you very much. Um, you talked a little bit about getting people into the sector um, and you mentioned up at the beginning of your presentation about, you know, billionaires blasting themselves into space. I mean, we're in a very interesting period, I think, both in space and indeed in wider aerospace and aviation about with climate control is, is you know, who, who is, you know, is it the same positive thing that we used to think about in the 60s when just achieving the technical aim was was, was all we needed to think about? So how do you see that that cultural social aspect and, and how do we make space attractive to a next generation, um, you know, by, by emphasising what the value of it is to, to society? Yeah, I think, you know, I mentioned I, in the present in one of the present one of the slides, I mentioned the narratives of um, uh, of of space agencies. And I think certainly in terms of the space sector, narrative, you know, space sector needs narratives to draw people in. And the interesting thing about the about the narrative of space now is the whole concept of uh, sustainability. 
So, you know, there, there are a couple of narratives that draw people into the space sector. One is, you know, ultimately people want to work on an interesting problem. And the interesting problem is framed by a narrative. And so there are multiple narratives that exist. So the first one is going to be, uh, well, actually, we can build the impossible. And so if you look at the uh, the, the space sectors of this world, if you look at the um, ISIs, which are basically well, they, they were a university spin out, uh, a bunch of students that uh, basically created uh, an ISAR uh, satellite, and now they've become an amazing uh, uh, independent uh, floated business in its own right. You know, you can you can build you can build the impossible, and so you have some people that want to be part of that. Then the other thing is in terms of the sustainability piece and the sustainability uh, agenda. Sustainability means different things to different people, and that's on a technological as as a technological problem, but also as a legal problem. Uh, as well, and also as a policy problem. And that will draw people in, in terms of uh, diversification. Now you've got things such as uh, you have uh, space as a, as a critical infrastructure. Because it's considered as a critical infrastructure, you now have civilian and also defence narratives as well. And that will also draw uh, people in as well. So there are lots and lots of narratives now around space which go beyond exploration, which go beyond uh, space agency agendas as well, which is bring, basically bring, which is drawing a lot of, uh, of 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 individuals or people into the uh, into the sector. Okay, thank you. And I think that that segues quite nicely into a question we've had about. You talked about regulation. Who do you think will be doing the regulating, and what do you think the regulatory framework might look like? Okay, well, that's a very difficult question, right? So, uh, in terms of who's doing the regulation, so yes, we we mentioned the the uh, outer space treaties and uh, and the and the organisations behind them. So they still have a very very important role, and that will continue to uh, to to uh, to to, uh, to carry on. Um, in terms of uh, in, in terms of who's driving that, um, again, it comes down to the uh, uh, comes down to these. Uh, these incumbents, right, such as the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs and things like that. So, you know, there are lots of there are regulations that are coming on board, your kite marks and all sorts of things. So those will come and they are coming and they need to come. The question that I get is the push who's pushing back on regulation. If if a, if, a, if an NGO is creating the regulation, is it is there, is there pushback from commercial entities? And the answer is no. In fact, they embrace the regulation. They need it. And the reason why they need the regulation is because the space sector needs to be sustainable on a commercial front and underpinning that has to be some sort of regulation so that uh, you know all bits are kept not relatively clear but certainly uh, managed in some particular way the space environment whether it's around our planet or other other planets are, uh, are are monitored and regulated in some particular way okay thank you uh, we've had another question um, you talked earlier about difficulty getting small companies to grow into larger companies. Uh, and um, the questioner asked if you could compare and contrast that situation in the UK, Europe, the US and elsewhere. And are, do, you do you think there are any significant business growth problems beside the TRL Valley of Death? OK, let me I'm just making some notes here. OK, <laughs> Europe, US and uh, others. OK, in terms of the fact that let me think. In terms of uh, growing the businesses, I think that the make I think the fundamental things are obviously um, appetite of uh, from the underlying investors. So traditionally, U.S. Uh, investors are seen as uh, let's say more risk uh, takers than uh, in, uh, in 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 Europe. And then likewise, uh, if you look at uh, APAC and Southeast Asia. The investors there are really seen as uh, were traditionally seen as essentially following and uh, that their, their risk appetite was actually uh, not that great. Has that changed? Yes, it has. It's changed a lot, actually. And really what's happening here now is is the underlying support from space agencies in terms of commercial contracts, uh, in terms of uh, space companies and how they're growing across the world. And because you're having this, this maturity in terms of access to contracts and commercial contracts in particular, let's say around the world, what you will see here is that there'll be a lot, there'll be balancing in terms of uh, the types of businesses that are being grown, that are moving from seed to, uh, to series A and series B beyond as well. So I think traditionally you could say, yes, go to the States 
and uh, grow your business here because there wasn't the appetite for the commercial contract in Europe. But actually, that's changing completely now. And I would say if you're going to build a business uh, in Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, um, Germany, Italy, wherever, you have every chance of, uh, of, of securing a contract, growing and actually moving beyond the valley of death. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question here. You talked about the importance of data um, and uh, we've had a question you said, is one of the challenges that you know aerospace companies, traditional aerospace companies don't know how to use data scientists and tech disruptors don't know how to use engineers. So the question is, have you seen any good examples of startups that have built well-balanced teams to accelerate their businesses? So I think the I think the this is a legacy issue here, right? So in terms of the data piece, if you are building a business and trying to access data, you have two options. Either you build in, you have an in-house capability or you outsource that capability. The issue that you had uh, um, historically is if you if you built that capability in-house, it was dedicated to a particular data set. It was quite exclusive, quite narrow. And if another data set came along, you know, there's not a lot. You had to rebuild that capability. What's happened here now with the commoditization of, um, of of data and actually the huge amount and the diverse amount of data is that you have a new set of incumbents of such uh, of uh, of data aggregators. For example, you've got um, uh, I don't know there are some companies up at uh, Harwell such as uh, Resitec and uh, and and a few other things where basically what they are doing is that they are creating uh, let's say data not just the repositories but the actual um the platforms the data platforms where the data is aggregated and actually can be um uh can, can be processed in a, in a way where it then becomes an actionable piece of data and so that's what's changing a lot of these incumbents going out here out, uh, that, that, are, that are being created and what happens now is well actually you know what i don't need to um i, I don't need to build that uh, capability in-house i can go to an external I can, and, and that external can actually um, uh, provide that uh, uh, th that process data piece for me. And in addition to that, you then have the public organ of the space agencies, in particular Copernicus, the Copernicus data, where they actually have these free data sets. And with that free data sets comes the come the APIs and the underlying tools and platforms to process that. So you don't need to be a let's say you you don't need to be a specialist anymore. Okay, that's great. And, and maybe that leads into the, to the next question we've had, which is what, what would be your best advice to teenage students who are looking to make a, a career in space? Ah, okay. So what I tell everybody is the first thing is think, just realise that the space sector is very diverse. So you don't need to be an aerospace engineer. Uh, to be in the space sector. So that's uh, that, that's point number one. Point number two is that the future of the space professional is changing a lot in terms of um, the skill sets that are required by the space sector. So let's say you take a traditional route and you do an aerospace engineering degree or aerospace masters, but you're thinking, well, hang on, well, I want to be in the space sector. What else can I bring to the table? I would say have a look at additional developing additional skill sets, such as um, uh, coding or some sort of compute, uh, edge, um, uh, cloud uh, infrastructure, machine learning. If that doesn't really float your boat, then there are other things such as um, uh, contracts, legal, um, accounting, that sort of stuff as well. So the sector is going to need, as well as technical capability, as well as dedicated, let's say, space capability, it's also going to require other additional skill sets as well. And I would say keep looking at, at the space sector, keep looking at the jobs, at the agency jobs, and you see the completely the, the complete diverse range of uh, of skills. And the other thing that I, I, that I tell um, students also is that most students don't get their dream jobs, or let's say us, Space professionals don't get our dream jobs until we're in our mid to late thirties. So you know, be you know, you can you can diversify. You can go out of the sector and then come back into the sector. And usually, the skills that you picked up outside of the sector are the ones that actually will open the doors for you to actually enter the sector and eventually get your dream your dream job. So for the young for the young young people, they've got lots of time on their hands. 
Thank you. Right, I'm going to take the, the very last question uh, for today. And really, it's just going back to the, really the sort of title of your talk about breaking rules. Uh, the question is, which rules might be broken but shouldn't be? <laughs> well, I think it comes back to the regulation piece, right? So, uh, you know, ideally, you don't want to break uh, the regulation rule. Um, uh, but thing is, uh, what what uh, what drove the new space um, agenda? Really, it was uh, breaking the rules and breaking the norm as well. So I think, um, yeah, I think as we move to uh, the evolution of the space sector and the whole concept of sustainability, I think we need to be really, really careful in terms of uh, where we are in terms of breaking the sustainability rules. OK, uh, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now to Claudine Fair, who's the chair of the AIAA's Diversity Inclusion Working Group for the Vote of Thanks. Thank you so much for this informative lecture and for the reminder that we have to continue to break the rules, just like our pioneer, the aerospace pioneers like Mary Jackson, um, continue to break the rules. We must continue to develop, um, we must continue to invest um, at record levels in, in quality underrepresented businesses and develop a workforce that is representative of the world population. Um, there is definitely a shortage of, in the workforce. Um, however, there are countries and demographics that are largely untapped. Um, and to fill these gaps and to fill these shortages, we must continue to make people aware of the bountiful um, diverse careers that are available in space. And we must encourage them to pursue their dreams. As you mentioned, regardless of what their dream is, there is space in a space industry for their dreams, right? So we want to continue to do that um, and break down the barriers of inclusion for underrepresented populations. Um, as chair of the um, American Institute of of Aeronautics and Astronautics Diversity Working Group, there's a number of ways that we are working with um, within the U.S. and also benchmarking the Royal Aeronautical Society to figure out ways to diversify the space industry and allow um, underrepresented populations to um, now have a part in the aerospace industry. Um, so I really appreciate your um, lecture and showing us the world of possibilities and what the future holds. Um, I'd love to share a little bit about um, what we're doing here in the U.S. if we want to go to the next slide. So um, in the United States, or um, and the AIAA is it definitely an international organization, um, we've created the Diversity Working Group to encourage participation and collaboration across all genders, ethnicities, races, um, to enhance the entire industry. We have um, various subcommittees that uh, work to do this. We have the Outreach Subcommittee, which um, works to spotlight the works of underrepresented populations and their contributions to the aerospace industry. We also have the Recognitions um, Working Group who work to, um, to recognize pioneers, allies in the diversity and inclusion um, workspace with, as it relates to um, aerospace and also the programming subcommittee, which develops programs to inform the populations or strategies on how we can diversify the aerospace industry. And a leadership subcommittee works um, some of the activities within a leadership subcommittee includes the diversity scholars program where we take where we reach out to college students who are underrepresented and give them an opportunity to come to some of the Amer AIAA conferences um, and really get a glimpse of what the future holds. And those are definitely impactful um, programs that we've been able to um, utilize. So um, we can go to the next slide. Um, and I, with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Richard. Claudine, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so I'm just going to very briefly talk about the 
uh, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the Royal Aeronautical Society and what we're doing. Uh, we are the sponsors for the Society's EDI strategy, uh, which obviously the, the Council and the Trustees uh, uh, deliver, but we, we help them develop that. We measure progress because uh, obviously it's about, as Claudine said, it's about moving forward. Uh, we do that against the Royal Academy of Engineering's progression framework and we do regular uh, stock checks against that to see how the society is, is moving in DNI. Uh, we work with other parts of the society. We're a large organisation with 25,000 members across the world. So clearly it doesn't all come from the EDI committee. So we help the society's boards, committees, specialist groups and branches with their work on EDI to ensure that we are making progress across the society. And we offer helpful guides and advice, which you can find on our website, the address of which is on the slide, uh, where you can find out more information about how to embed EDI in, in, in both your society's work, but also as a professional, because that's our role as a professional body is to develop, um, you know, people in the sector who, who can bring EDI to their day jobs as much as to uh, volunteering activity in the society. Uh, we do a number of events such as this name lecture and articles and podcasts. You'll find them on the society's podcast channels and on the YouTube channel. So please do check those out. There have been some interesting webinars in, in recent months. And just before Christmas, we launched our new equity, diversity and inclusion feedback process because we were very conscious that, uh, you know, as an organisation that wants to learn and get better, uh, we hadn't really had a very effective means for people to come back and say uh, this is how we could see improvement on EDI in however you experience the society. Uh, that process is now live, there's a launch video on the YouTube channel, so if you want to find out more you can on our website. And next slide please. So uh, that concludes the this year's annual Mary Jackson Name Lecture. My thanks to our speaker, our, our, my thanks to the AIAA for their assistance and to the uh, team here at the Royal Aeronautical Society who've been diligently working away in the background to make it all technologically work and uh, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. <laughs>